Could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Here. Cummings? Here. Hernandez? Present. McPherson? Here. And Friend? Here. Um, if we could begin with a moment of silence. Would any supervisor like to dedicate this moment of silence? Okay. If we could just begin with a moment of silence before the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, Chair Friend and members of the board, there's a, no, a couple of changes to the consent agenda. Uh, item number 18, there's additional materials. The re revised memo packet pages 258 to 259 are replaced. Uh, the analysis paragraph two, sentence two, uh, should read, the initial public release of the new app is anticipated in late September and will include all functionality from the current My Santa Cruz County app with an updated user interface design. Subsequent updates to the new app throughout the pilot period will introduce several of the following blockchain-based services. In addition, item number 25 on the consent agenda, staff requests that this item be deleted. This is packet pages 304 through 322, and that um, concludes the corrections to the agenda. Okay, are there any items that board members would like to pull from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? Chair, I would like to remove item 15, the response to the grand jury reports. Okay, item 15 will become, um, do you think this will be a brief item? Should I put it at the top of the regular agenda? Uh, I think it can go at the top. I don't think it'll take too much time. Okay, it'll become item 6.1, Madam Clerk. Are there any other items we'd like to pull from the consent to the regular agenda? All right, see none, we'll open it up for the community. It's an opportunity for you to address us on items that are not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors or within the consent agenda or the regular agenda if you are unable to stay. Good morning. Hi. Welcome, welcome back. Thank you. Can, can you just give me like two seconds to take a deep breath and get kind of centered before you start my time? Yeah. Okay, because I, you know, I want to be present and calm and, okay, I'm ready to, um, do my talk. So my name is Kirsten Jewell. I am a licensed clinical social worker and our senior mental health client specialist for our county. And I'm here to address the CEO's um, rebuttal to the grand jury report. I find that many of the um, responses to the arguments are very weak um, and omitting many truths. The first uh, one that I would like to address is the argument that this is a nationwide crisis and therefore it Whoa, did it go away? And so to me, that argument seems to be very equivalent to saying that all my neighbors are drunks and abusive and therefore I don't need to get sober and stop hitting my kids. I think that this, this argument would not be acceptable to the child welfare system. It would not be acceptable to the criminal justice system. And I'm angered that the CEO and some of the BOS has also used that argument and given that argument to our community. I also want to address that the CEO states that we have 288 funded positions in the behavioral health department. Um, unfortunately, 30% of those are vacant, which is roughly 90 positions. We have a third of the staff doing the work for our entire community. Um, of those 90 positions, 43 of those positions are licensed mental health or licensed clinical um, workers. And these are the people that are, have been trained and educated to serve mental illness in our community. The positions that are being um, staffed are for community health workers, which is peer support workers, and people that do not have a graduate degree that are, are trained and able to meet the needs of our community mental health needs. I am angered that, that the argument is leaving out this information. It's leaving out the, the information that our community is suffering 
because our behavioral health department is so broken, it is common knowledge that us in the behavioral health department tell our clients, we tell our friends and our families to go elsewhere for psychiatric care. We, we tell people to go to CHOMP, we tell people to go to Good Samaritan, because you will not get the care you need in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us? Good morning. Good morning, welcome. Morning. Hello, my name is Max Wilkowski Letts. I'm also a social worker with Santa Cruz County Behavioral Health, following up with Kirsten. When the grand jury report came out, it was a rallying cry for us. It was the things that we had been screaming and shouting for years upon deaf ears. It was validation for all of the things that we had been trying to argue when we were negotiating contracts, when we were discussing with our, with our bosses, and most importantly, when we were discussing with our clients, explaining to them why we were unable to provide services. The CAO response was a punch to the guts. I understand that their responsibility is to demonstrate that they are doing their job and doing their job well, but to contest all of the major issues and then attempt to slip it into the agenda without there being any more discussion or debate was devastating. I have written a brief rebuttal that I have included that you all have access to, but I'm just one social worker on Google at home on the weekend. I'm not an analyst. When you hire analysts, when you go through the work of crafting a report, crafting a grand jury report, that is the standard that I would hope you go by. These are professionals doing their job and telling you what the problem is. And they were not subtle, understaffed, overworked, underfunded. It was extremely clear. And any rebuttal that challenges those key points is, is madness to me. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us before we go online? Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. What is it? September 12th, 2023. Wish I had a chance to write this down and be easier to read. Um, I'm kind of not just addressing this county, but all 3,100 counties. According to this information, you know, it seems valid to me. Hospitals across the United States have killed COVID-19 inpatients since May of 2020, as witnessed by hundreds on record testifying that the COVID-19 protocol is murder by numbers. The crime proceeds as follows. One, isolate presume, presumed COVID-19 inpatients and family and friends so that they are without allies. Two, deny them basic health and hygiene so they fester in their own filth. Three, limit fluids and nutrition to IV so they starve. Four, deny them exercise so they atrophy. Five, administer oxygen at levels that damage their lungs so that they are unable to be remove from hospital equipment. Six, administer remdesivir that inadvertently against the patients and their families' wishes damages their kidneys so it causes them to fail and their lungs. Seven, ventilate them against them and patients' families' wishes. Eight, medicate and overdose them to levels. So I'm totally questioning the fiduciary trust. I'm standing on this side of this maritime courtroom there's like six different legal jurisdictions that I could actually talk about if I had some time. My biggest issue with this board is that we cannot pull different items off the consent agenda and talk about them. Further, in the city of Santa Cruz, you can talk for three minutes on all the subjects and a citizen can, or an individual can pull an item off the consent agenda. The consent agenda item number 18 about the digital wallets, if people really knew what was going on, they probably make some changes. So that's enough for now. It's great to see all of you here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Liam McLaughlin. I'm staff with uh, SKU 521, represents the, the county workers. I was just here in support of um, Max and Kirsten in the Behavioral Health Department. Also wanted to thank um, uh, Supervisor Koenig and the board for uh, pulling that item and having um, a good discussion just about uh, the, the work that still needs to be done in the behavioral health department. Our worry and our concern was that um, the, the CAO's recommended response uh, kind of suggests that there's nothing more really to be done at this time until until the next contract negotiation. Um, we believe that that's very much not the case. The workers who came before you today are, are, are in a very urgent uh, 
I have a lot of urgency around this issue. So just encouraging you to please um, not take that line that, you know, we can just wait until the next contract to address the, uh, the dire issues in the behavioral health department. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, I'm Tiffany Cantrell Warren. I am the director of the County Behavioral Health Department. And I'd like to use my time today to thank the board for um, proclaiming that the month of September 2023 is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month in our county. And I'd like to read off some information that I think is pertinent to anyone listening. The month of September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And it's a time when we promote awareness of suicide prevention resources. And we really encourage people well, year round to seek help when they are in crisis. Suicide is a very serious public health problem that causes immeasurable pain, suffering, and loss for individuals, families, and our community. In Santa Cruz, an average of 40 people died by suicide each year from 2018 to 2022. That's a death rate of 14.76 per 100,000 people, which is higher than the state average of 10.7. Suicide is excuse me, the 10th leading cause of death among Americans and the second leading cause of death among young people ages 10 to 34. The Santa Cruz County Suicide Prevention Plan outlines a path to supporting those who are feeling hopeless and works to raise awareness, provide education and support services for suicide loss. We work toward reducing and ending suicide deaths and we urge all community members to play a role in prevention and promoting health and wellness. We also want to let people know that 988 has been established as a national suicide prevention and crisis hotline for anyone who is seeking immediate help. And I just want to say that for those in our community who have lost a friend or a loved one due to suicide, we see you and we grieve with you. And for anyone who is considering suicide or has considered suicide, please, I want you to know that you are irreplaceable and to please call 988 if you are feeling like you need any support or services. We are here for you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. I have had three acquaintances commit suicide. It is devastating. Um, I want to speak briefly about consent item 17, uh, adoption of a re resolution so Santa Cruz County Fire Department personnel can participate in and be compensated for mutual aid response. Thank you. It is high time that the volunteers of Santa Cruz County Fire be recognized and compensated as equals in our fire agencies. And they are just as well trained as those who are full-time paid firefighters and emergency responders. And they care about the community and they know their communities. To that end, I want to again ask your board to um, have an after action review of the CZU fire with county fire staff and the volunteers. That has not happened. We're three years past the CZU fire. There was no after action report by CZU, by uh, CAL FIRE, and uh, the county's only attempt at it was to ask them why not. The County's only after action review was with the operational administration end. The volunteers of County Fire saved many homes at a time when they were told by Cal Fire to go home. This needs to have an after action review so we can plan effectively for the next time something like the CZU fire happens. It's still in the public's eye. I was at um, Congressman Panetta's town hall meeting at Capitola City Hall talking about FEMA, CZU fire came up. It's not over yet and we have a lot of work to do and it should start with an after action review with county fire. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers that would like to address us? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, Chair, we have speakers. Call in user Ending in 8204, your microphone is now available. Uh, 
call in user 8204. Your microphone is now available. Excellent. Hi, good morning. My name is Diane, and I'm calling today to talk about uh, the digital wallet number 18 on the agenda. And uh, I just want to make people aware of these digital payment apps like my city of Santa Cruz is offering. I think as people are being shuffled towards these form of uh, bill paying, uh, just be aware that they electronic payments are still hackable, they're still insecure, and in the long run, they really invade our privacy because, you know, as we've seen in China with social credit scores and such like that, everything we buy can be tracked and traced. We have no privacy anymore. Even using government entities like the city of Santa Cruz or FedNow, having that intermediary you know, body to have all our payments go through just really set this up to be um, cut off from our own finances. So as convenient as it is, I just want people to really think about keeping cash alive and using it and, and having that cash economy. It really serves a lot of poor people in this county and uh, we really, really can't afford to let it go. So I say, as we move forward, you know, investigate this stuff more for yourself. Learn about, you know, why it's important to keep cash alive in a community. And, uh, and uh, we're gonna really need to start recognizing that we're gonna go into harder times. So help each other you know, find your courage and be good citizens towards each other, but you know, do, do our best, but um, please educate yourself a little bit further on all these digital apps that are being offered to us now. All right, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Rachel Sotos, your microphone is now available. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I would like to um, underscore the importance of what the previous speaker said about the digital wallet. And I want to express concern that there's a vast discrepancy between the seemingly benign things that are offered like a swim pass and an RV license or something, and the uh, possibility that government services generally could be provided and streamlined onto a, a digital format and government through uh, uh, your cell phone is tyranny. It's absolute tyranny. The uh, the most frightening example of this would be the DIA, the digital wallet that the USAID provided to the Ukrainians, uh, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And um, it's just really something to, to be concerned about. I would suggest we have a complete moratorium on, on it. Um, in my remaining minute, I would like to reiterate um, the suggestion that the Santa Cruz uh, Board of Supervisors, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors convene something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to fully and transparently evaluate what has transpired during the COVID um, era. Uh, a good example here might be Gavin Newsom. As you probably all know, he was featured on Meet the Press this last Sunday and said that California did almost everything wrong and that he would rethink everything, that the criticisms of the lockdowns are valid. I previously made an appeal directly to Chairman Friend. I'd like to directly appeal to um, Supervisor Cummings at this point. If I remember correctly, when Supervisor Cummings was mayor of Santa Cruz early in the lockdowns, he suggested that this was going to be policy until we get a vaccine. I'd like to uh, invite a supervisor Cummings to reflect on and to share with the community his decision making process and his sources of information. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional speakers online? Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett and Thanks to the previous speakers for their valuable factual input. And regarding COVID-19, I have a brochure here called Myths and Truths About COVID-19, Contagious Virus or 5G Microwave Technology. There's a lot more to this whole issue than what the Board of Supervisors is revealing. That's why I and others 
put facts into the record here. You can see this document at westonaprice.org slash um, coronavirus. Here's the connection. And for years, I provided you with data on the hazards of microwave radiation from all of this 4G cell phones, cell towers, 5G. So here is many COVID-19 and the 5G connection. Many epidemiological observations and biological studies indicate the disease called COVID-19 is actually radiation poisoning caused by exposure to microwaves used in 5G wireless technology that first appeared in Wuhan, China, when the city turned on 10,000 5G base stations. It spread to Spain and Italy as all these nations deployed 5G technology. And my own comments here, the county is installing 5G technology everywhere, including these street lights. And it needs to be. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Are there any other speakers online? There are no further speakers. All right, we'll bring it back to the board for discussion and then action on the consent agenda. We'll begin uh, to my right with Supervisor McPherson. Do you have any comments on the consent agenda? Yeah, a couple of comments on uh, item 17, the firefighters mutual aid response issue. I want to thank the general services for bringing that to the board, uh, this resolution, and I support our efforts to recruit and retain our volunteer firefighters. Uh, providing mutual aid is uh, a great opportunity to gain more experience and it's funded through the state, which is great. So uh, I really want to say to those volunteer firefighters too, what a tremendous job you do and what, how valuable you are to Santa Cruz County. I was going to have some comments on 25, but that's been pulled. Um, and item number 30, the Janus contract, I'm pleased to see us bring back uh, the recovery center uh, across the street it has been uh, a valuable tool in helping address people's immediate issues without directly incarcerating them. And uh, it's a burden on law enforcement. It takes up space in the jail, which is always seems to be overcrowded. And I appreciate the partnership with Janice and the sheriff's office in this issue to make uh, this happen. And I'm pleased that uh, most of the funding again will come to the state. I think it's over 90% of the funding comes from the state. Uh, on item 33, the behavioral health housing, thank you to the behavioral health department and health services leadership for pursuing participation in this program. Uh, it's designed to help those who are the most vulnerable and difficult to serve uh, in the realm of people experiencing, experiencing homelessness now. Uh, it's a high percentage, uh, usually is what's recorded of uh, those in need of behavioral health um, services uh, who are homeless. Um, there's a lot of conversation at the state level about housing and mental health priorities and funding methods. Um, we really must ensure that we have permanent supportive housing uh, for folks coming out of the shelters and other situations. And the stability of the housing is such an important element that we need to address in the effort and to maintain good mental health and behavioral health uh, services in this community. Uh, usually in the homeless issue, it's at least a third. And now I, most estimates are that half of those people who are homeless are in need of some kind of services uh, for behavioral health. So uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, step we're taking forward. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. On item 22, a resolution in support of a California carbon fee and dividend program in support for AB 858, the climate cash back program. I wanna thank Supervisor Hernandez for co-authoring this item with me. Now, 2023 is set to be the hottest year on record. It's impossible to wake up these days without reading about some new uh, unfolding of the climate crisis. Today, we heard about catastrophic floods in Libya, Libya that have killed more than 2000 people. And so it's clear that we have to do more and we have to create comprehensive programs to address the climate crisis. If there is one policy that could be called a silver bullet to deal with the climate crisis, it's carbon fee and dividend because it puts our entire economy uh, at work at adapting to uh, the crisis in, in front of us. Basically, it's so simple as to put a 
price on carbon that everyone pays, whether uh, a, a price that goes on things like feedlot beef or goods imported from China, things that have an emission profile associated with them. Uh, and then it takes the proceeds of this program, divides it up evenly and gives it back to everyone in the state. Uh, so the result is that people who aren't flying around in private jets are probably uh, going to be paying people who are lower income are probably going to be paying less in fees and they're receiving back in dividends because it puts money in people's pockets to actively adapt to climate change. Um, you know, I know some would say that a comprehensive system like this is, uh, is is impossible to get everyone on board with, but I think we've got to ask. Everything's impossible till it's done, uh, and we have more clout in the legislature, more seniority than we ever have. Um, so I think it's a good time to put this forward uh, and, and say that it's a priority for our legislature legislators to work on. And of course, there's AB858 is in effect uh, a currently proposed bill, the Climate Cashback Program. Uh, that's an opportunity to set up the dividend side of this program. Um, so kind of a one-two step potential here. So again, thank you to Supervisor Hernandez for seeing the wisdom of this program and co-authoring it with me. On item 30, approving the agreement with Janice for the uh, operation of the Recovery Center, also called the Sobering Center. Uh, just also want to express my thanks to CEO Amber Williams, who's here with us today, as well as the entire Janus team for operating this program. Um, you know, we always hear from law enforcement how important this program is as a way to divert people from the jail. Uh, and it'll be really great to have it back at the beginning of next year. And then also on item 33, I want to, uh, the, the $10 million we're uh, set to receive from the state for behavioral health bridge housing. I just want to point out, we are doing exactly what everyone keeps saying we should be doing and what we, we agree, which is using modular construction to quickly build housing for people experiencing homelessness on county property. It's exactly what we're going to do. We're also going to uphold uh, our commitment that this board has made to build un build uh, at least 120 of these uh, of new housing units in the unincorporated part of the county so that we're sharing the burden equally uh, with the cities. So uh, again, excited to see this move forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Supervisor Cummings. Okay. Yeah, similar comments to Supervisor McPherson. I just wanted to thank um, the county for moving forward on item number 17 with the um, volunteer emergency response personnel to participate and be compensated for mutual aid response um, as it relates to firefighting. I mean, we're going to need all hands on deck as, as often as possible when we're fighting fires. And so um, to the extent that we can incorporate our volunteer firefighters into these efforts, I think we'll be much better off. And so I want to thank um, the staff for, for bringing this forward. Um, also, I uh, just want to express my appreciation for item number 30 with the Recovery Center. Um, it's a great way to keep people out of our criminal justice system and provide them with opportunities to, um, to sober up and find a, a better path forward. And so I just want to uh, thank the county for continuing to re well, for reopening those services. And then um, item number 33, the behavioral health uh, housing um, to Supervisor McPherson and Koenig's point. I think it's really good that we're continuing to move forward with providing support for homeless residents and a place for them to go where they can receive care and support that they need to get back on their feet. And so just want to continue to acknowledge the efforts that the county is making on a homelessness because sometimes it goes underappreciated. And so just want to continue to see how we can work on this effort moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Any comments? Okay. Mm. Um, items uh, 20 and 21, I want to thank staff uh, for these items, uh, for working with the commission on these items. Uh, you know, I think that mobile, you know, the mobile homes that we have in our county are really the last bastion of real affordable, house, affordable housing in our county and really the only form of rent and control of any kind in our county. So I appreciate staff working on these items uh, with the commission. And uh, item 22, I want to thank Supervisor Koenig uh, for, you know, allowing me to partner also to address climate change needs in our county. And I want to thank the the uh, SEIU workers uh, from Behavioral Health uh, for showing up and I appreciate uh, them bringing the concerns to us. Uh, I believe that you know, there's probably more that we could do. And I want to make sure that we find out more myself personally, what we could do and possibly form some sort of, you know, fact finding committee uh, to address these issues. Uh, being from South County, I know for sure, looking through the lens of equity, I want to make sure and assure that we also bring in um, that we bring in more Spanish speaking behavioral health workers and we retain them as well. Um, and of course, you know, compensate them for this as well fairly. Uh, so that's one of the concerns that I would like to see addressed in, in, 
in, in this as well. Um, but that's pretty much it for my comment. Thank you, Supervisor Hernandez. Supervisor Cummings? I, I did just want to uh, make one quick comment. I know item number 25 was removed. This is an item that I placed on the agenda, but I was informed this morning that SB 423 actually passed yesterday. And so I uh, reached out earlier to County CAO to pull this item, given that it's already been voted on at both the Senate and the Assembly. And so just wanted to bring that up for transparency to the board and to the community. Thank you for that clarification. Supervisor McPherson, you had additional Yeah, comments. I just wanted to make uh, one comment on item number 40, the uh, notice of completion of the East Siany Road project it came in just hundreds of dollars under the budget uh the uh the bid price but this is critical up there uh in the san Lorenzo valley it's a critical egress ingress uh road for the people up in the cyan area so i just want to say uh job well done and thanks to our uh Matt Machado and his team for getting these things done we have such a backlog of fires or of, of road uh improvements to do oh, going back to our 16 17 storms uh it's it's difficult to catch up. We're doing the best we can, and I think our our departments are doing a very good job of getting there with the funding that we have. Thank you. I'll make some brief comments on the recovery center as well. Uh, first, I just want to actually acknowledge the sheriff, who, when he very first ran for sheriff, said that this was his primary issue that he wanted to address, and brought this forward to the board. And it's something that uh, has been. A primary focus of his and I think is really going to help transform the local criminal justice system because it treats an issue that really is a health issue as what it should be, which is the health primary issue. Uh, in most local jails in the state of California, the number one um, arrest is for 647F or public intoxication or issues associated with it. So clearly this is not something that should be tying up the local jail resources and something that should be treated as a health and addiction issue. And Janice, there's no better local social service provider than Janice to do exactly that. And so I, I'm glad to see Janice's partnership and appreciate the work of the sheriff on that. All right, that was my only comments on consent. Uh, is there a motion for consent? I'll move consent agenda. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Hernandez, a second from Supervisor Koenig. If we could have a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? And friend? Aye. And that passes unanimously. We'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which was the pulled item on consent, which was item do you remember the number 15 15, 15 sorry uh which was item 15 originally which is the approve accept and file responses to findings and recommendations of two 2022-23 santa cruz county civil grand jury reports and take related actions as recommended by the cao we have the board memo and the responses on various issues supervisor koenig you had pulled this item Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I pulled the items so that we could talk more specifically about the response to the behavioral health report. Uh, we've heard from a few members, uh, a few county employees today um, who work in this department. Sure. Um, and I can assure you, having uh, met with them, that there are many, many, many more who feel the same way, uh, who were not able to show up this morning. Um, and so I just felt that, first of all, uh, in deference to uh, the, the gravity of this issue, that the board should discuss a little bit further. Um, and se second, um, I do have a proposed uh, additional uh, action that we can do here um, and you know, thought the board should discuss and see you know, if this uh, is sufficient or if there's other things we want to do. Um, in my time discussing with our, our current employees, uh, the issue they brought to my attention that Monterey County recently did a 10.9% increase for some of their classifications within the social worker and program uh, manager division. Um, and uh, Looking at that, it seems like it would be appropriate to, to start a similar process and uh, run a salary survey for the so social worker series, uh, really, I think as quickly as possible, say by the end of the year, um, so that we can ensure that our social workers are being appropriately compensated. Um, so that's the, uh, that would be the additional action that I would recommend. Um, but again, one pull this item so that we could have a discussion on it. Um, Mr. Palacios. I'm just trying to understand if you could um, be more specific. Um, are you talking specifically about behavioral health unit and the um, mental health client specialists, the social workers in behavioral health? Or are you talking more broadly about all social workers because they're social workers in numerous departments? Sure, I was contemplating just the uh, social workers within the behavioral health unit. Sure. In the behavioral health. Okay. Um, uh, why don't you go ahead and comment about that? Yeah, and, and are, are you... Um, 
would the motion be to request a salary survey as additional direction as opposed to making decisions about about salaries and the reason why i ask is because this was not agendized as part of this item and so i'm trying to puzzle yeah, through so that the, issue the motion the additional um direction i'd recommend is that we run a salary survey for the social worker series within the behavioral health unit by uh, the end of this year Are there any other comments from board members on this item? Supervisor Hernandez. If you know, I, in in terms of like which um, which job categories are haven't been filled, if we can sort of prioritize those as well too. I know that there's a lot of openings that are very uh, detrimental to our departments, but they just haven't been filled. If we can also prioritize those as part of the survey study, uh, uh, kind of friendly, I don't know if it's even a friendly amendment, it's probably, I think Supervisor Koenig probably intends that in his motion. That you're, those are, again, you're, um, just to clarify, you're talking specifically about behavioral health division. Yes. Okay. Yes. So kind of prioritize the ones that are in desperate need, right? I think that the ones that the department has prioritized they are needed and i i i'm sure i'm sure that that's what manu intends right uh, but generally speaking yes but i think we do need enough specificity to you know ensure that staff has sufficient direction right. i had a couple questions related to this and um I had uh, members of SEIU reach out to me last time. I've actually had an opportunity to meet with some of the behavioral health workers in here, many of their concerns. Um, I'm, my understanding is that in uh, fall of 2021, as part of the labor contract, um, there was the creation of a health services agency recruitment and retention committee. I'm just wondering if that committee is still working and if there's any way we can get an update on the progress that they were, that they've made to date. Sure. Um, I believe we have um, the director and division manager from um, health services agency, as well as personnel, um, I believe can comment about the um, status of the recruitment and retention committee. Do we know who all was in that committee, by the way? Yeah, we can show, okay. clarify right now. Good morning, Nisha Patel, Deputy Director of Personnel. And the HSA Recruitment and Retention Committee was uh, formed in an effort to uh, review uh, not only the recruitment side of things, but as well the second part of it, which was the hiring side. And out of that committee, we did create um, we actually have a dedicated team for HSA that is working on the recruitments specifically, and also working directly with the health services agency, uh, hiring supervisors and managers to identify areas where we can collaborate and um, improve our efforts in recruiting and hiring. Uh, that committee um, has been working um, over the last 18 months. Um, we also did a review of each of the divisions and the work that we create we did in the unit was to identify where we can make some improvements. So those are things that are work in progress um, at this time with the dedicated staff that we have for the for HSA recruitments. We know who's in it and is there a report available? So um, I was part of that committee as was the current director of behavioral health, um, Tiffany Contrell. There were other members of, of the personnel department, recruiting staff, and also uh, other members of the HSA recruitment, uh, excuse me, the uh, managers at HSA as well. Um, and we can, uh, there were, you know, the director of admin services from HSA was also a part of the committee and we had our recruiting analysts as well. Any, anyone from planning CDI on there? From the planning department? Yeah. Uh, no, this was specifically for the health services okay, agency. Health services agency. Okay. Yeah. Has there been a report or is there a, pl a planned report coming up? We have um, had some internal discussions with the health services agency um, around the efforts on that. And so we've had some um, internal discussion around what's come out of those reports. 
or those meetings, excuse me. Is it one that we'll see or? Mm -hmm. uh, we hadn't anticipated that. Back to Supervisor Cummings, is that okay? All right, Supervisor Cummings. Well, thank you for that update. I, I do think that in addition to um, Supervisor Koenig's direction, I think it would be good if we could get a report out on um, the work that that committee has conducted and recommendations. Um, it sounds like based on recommendation number one, that there have been um, some incentives. For example, they mentioned the public service loan forgiveness program, but it seems like, and they've also, and also when I met with um, personnel yesterday, there have been mention of increases in salary, but it seems like that's still not enough of an incentive. And so being able to see kind of what um, recommendations are being discussed in that committee and being able to understand what opportunities there are for us to create more incentives, I think would be important for this board to take into consideration. Um, there might be, you know, hiring bonuses, how, assistance with housing, um, it's because we know that housing is a big issue in this community. But um, I think that as we move forward in understanding this compensation study, it'd be really good to understand what um, the personnel has been hearing from staff and employees on what we, help, you know, we can do better at um, retaining um, staff. And, and I think that's important that um, during this process that um, the members of this committee are also working with the employees because when we met with the employees, there were a number of different things that they highlighted that would be helpful for them. And I think that if we can have that listed out and understand what action this board can take, it'd be really helpful at us trying to understand what things help with recruitment and retention of employees. Um, so I'll leave the, my comments on that there. And so I don't know if that needs to be incorporated into the motion as a friendly amendment that we get a report back from the, um, From the HSA the recruitment and retention committee um, at the end of this year. That's uh, certainly amenable to me as the maker of the motion. Yeah. Okay. I'll second the motion if it hasn't been seconded. All right. Well, we haven't gone to the community yet. We haven't made a motion yet. And so let's make sure that we actually have an opportunity. If you've already spoken on this item, though, actually, you can't speak again, unfortunately. But um, is there any additional member of the community that would like to address us on this pulled item? Yes, hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Mr. Friend, I appreciate that you allowed the public comment. I was looking forward to saying point of order, but didn't have that opportunity. So, you know, it seems interesting. This item talks about two items. And, um, but when you look on it, and I couldn't open it up on my phone for reasons that are unimportant, but it's actually six different items and four of them, the, the title is has to do with surveillance with the sheriff's office, the public defender. So um, I think if you guys are going to pull an item, maybe you should be a little bit more informed about that item. Um, I know that if I was more informed about it, I would be. I did apply to be part of the grand jury, but I told them if hey, they want an example of what I'm doing, they can look at any of hundreds of times I've spoken publicly. Of course they didn't choose me. That's enough for now. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in chambers would like to address us? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, we have speakers online. Call in user one. Your microphone is now available. Chairman Carrot, I filed a witness report uh, I'll, I'll read from a, a, a complaint about a friend of mine named Melinda. I put this report in your hands, Supervisor Koenig, a year ago, the report, um, and this is on the official record. Um, and it was to Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department. And this uh, took place on Friday, July 22nd, 2022. I was frightened and horrified to witness Melinda screaming, trying to protect herself as she was being held down and a needle was being thrust toward her. Six sheriff personnel 
a paramedic or two, and Shannon Bean with, in quotes, mental health, were all ganged up to inject 69-year-old thin Melinda. I heard Melinda yelling repeatedly, no, no, stop, help, get away from me. Suddenly she went limp as she was injected. Later she was taken to telecare and I commend social workers and I think they do need to be better paid. I spoke with Carrie Rose with Telecare's Crisis Stabilization Unit about 10 p.m. on Sunday, July 24, 2022. She told me that Melinda was there on a 5150 hold by order of the sheriff. They are a locked mental health crisis facility at 2250 Soquel Avenue. Carrie medically Thank assessed you, her. Is there anybody else online? No further speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll bring it back to the board for a motion. Supervisor Koenig, do you have a motion? And um, Mr. Palacios, do you have something additional you wanted to say? Yeah, I just wanted to um, clarify again the salary survey. Um, maybe um, HSA staff can comment. Uh, right now, I'm not sure if social workers is the right classification. So we're taking the broad view that Supervisor Hernandez brought up with positions with high vacancy rates. Um, um, but I want to clarify if 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 we want to specify the actual position, because I'm not sure social workers is the right mm -hmm. classification. morning board monica morales hsa director i will add that um what i'm sensing too is that you want us to explore the classifications do an assessment in general of which ones um you know how they compare to neighboring counties and then from there maybe bring a proposition to the board as what we're noting and i'll let um, our director of behavioral health give more detail of the ones that we're struggling with but it definitely is our licensed ones and you know go ahead to fit in. Yeah, the classification that we use in behavioral health for our mental health workers is the mental um, MH, mental health. Thank you, mental health client specialist, and then senior mental health client specialist is the one that's for licensed professionals. Um, so I would I would start with those two. We don't use the social worker classification in behavioral health. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So it'd be the mental health client specialists and senior mental health client specialist positions. Got it. Um, so then I would move that we uh, adopt the recommended actions for item 15 with the additional direction that we run a salary survey for the mental health client specialist and senior mental health client specialist positions and any other positions uh, with high vacancy rates that the department deems necessary with, uh, within the behavioral health division and that the board receive an update from the HSA recruitment and retention committee by the end of 2023. The end of 2023 deadline would apply to both the salary survey as well as the report. I'll second the motion. Thank you for articulating clean motion, Supervisor Koenig. Um, are there any other comments? Please. I just wanted to make make one more comment and just express that um, I, I believe that this board is very supportive of the county workforce. And I think that we need to do everything that's necessary to address these issues around recruitment and retention and continue to have these conversations throughout the year. Um, I know that we're going to be back in bargaining, I believe, next June, but we have an acute issue right now with um, with vacancies and those vacancies leading to employees being overworked and undercompensated, as we've seen in this in this uh, grand jury report. And I think that we need to take that seriously and continue to have conversations with our employees to understand how they're feeling around burnout or if they're feeling like they're being well supported and um, that this needs to be something that's ongoing so that we are maintaining a strong workforce, especially in these departments that provide some of the most essential services for many of our low income community members. And, um, and I also think that as part of that study, it would be good to understand because I do want to commend the staff's um, work to date. Um, they did highlight uh, being able to re recruit and hire um, more positions. But one of the things that stood out was also that between January 1st of 2023 and June 3rd, 2023, um, there were 159 employees that left HSA. 
And so we really need to make sure that that's not happening and that we have more hiring and more recruitment than we're seeing people walk away. And so um, I think together we can really make a difference. And I look forward to working with our employees and our county leadership to make sure that we can um, continue to have um, strong recruitment. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. If we get a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Yes. McPherson. Aye. And Brent. Aye. And that passes unanimously. We'll move on to item seven of the regular agenda, which is a public hearing to consider application 221359, a proposal to rezone APN 064-201-14 and 064-201-20 from the SU or special use zone district to the TP or timber production zone district to determine the proposal is exempt from the requirements of CEQA and approve in concept the ordinance amending zoning plan and map pursuant to chapter 13.10 of the Santa Cruz County Code, changing from one zone district to another to, score, to schedule the ordinance for final adoption on September 19th, 2023 and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the deputy CAO and director of community development infrastructure. We have the memo, the CEQA notice of exemption, the ordinance, the planning commission resolution minutes and the cover sheet and staff report. Good morning, welcome back. Yeah, good morning, Chair Friend and uh, members of the board. Evan Dittmars, Development Review Planner. Uh, this is an application to uh, rezone two parcels to the Timber Production Zone District, and it requires a zoning map amendment. Uh, the two properties are located roughly between Bonnie Dune and Highway 9 uh, on the outskirts of Felton, um, specifically 1.2 miles west of the Highway 9 and San Lorenzo Boulevard. Uh, intersections and immediately adjacent to the Felton Quarry. Uh, together, they total about 43 acres of steep, undeveloped, and forested land. Uh, the property owners, Cheryl and Seth Noble, live locally and are interested in pursuing a commercial timber harvest, uh, which requires a TP timber production zoning designation. The two parcels are presently uh, zoned special use. Uh, the rezone to TP would result in a designation which is consistent with the Mount Residential <coughs> Plan designation. Um, there are required findings to rezone a property, which are detailed in Santa Cruz County Code 1310-215 um, and noted here on this slide. Uh, findings number one and two are mandatory, and at least one of five additional findings are also required to be made. Uh, the additional findings made in support of this project are listed here as finding A and E and uh, detailed on page five of the staff report. Uh, the map here on the left represents the various zoning designations in the vicinity, including multiple adjacent TP zone parcels, which are represented by the dark green shading. Uh, the map on the right gives an idea of the topography of the properties, which are quite steep, and span either side of a canyon, uh, which is to say that um, future development on this property is highly unlikely to occur. Uh, this proposal is supported uh, in that active forest management in the form of timber harvest, uh, represents a public safety benefit to the neighborhood and um, economic benefit from the production of timber. Uh, this proposed rezoning to TP is statutorily exempt from CEQA under section 15264. And I will also note that uh, while the proposal amends the zoning designation, the timber harvest itself is subject to additional evaluation by the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Uh, therefore, uh, the staff recommendation for application 221359 is as follows. Uh, conduct a public hearing on application 221359. Determine the proposal is exempt from further review under the Environmental Quality Act, pursuant to Article 18, Section 15264, statutory exemptions for timberland preserves. Approve and concept the attached ordinance amending the zoning plan and map, pursuant to Chapter 1310 of the Santa Cruz County Code, changing from one district to another and to approve application 221359 based on the findings and conditions contained in the staff report to the Planning Commission dated May 24th, 2023, and to direct the clerk of the board to schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption at the September 19th, 2023 Board of Supervisors meeting. That concludes my presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Dittmar. Are there questions from board members? 
Seeing none, this is a public hearing. We'd like to open up the public hearing. Would any member of the community like to address us on this item? Yeah, hello, my name is James Ewing Whitman. Maybe I'll be brief. This piece of property came up a couple months ago in discussion, did it not? Uh, you may have seen this at the Planning Commission. Uh, but, but here? Uh, this specific property, no. Uh, it was a, there was a separate property also zoning. Okay, then production. I was, my specific comments were for if this were a similar one. Uh, but, no, this is okay, but thank you, but I will say that and I wish I had the dates uh, when this county rubber stamped through information on the 1310. What I discovered at that at that time, I thought there was something odd going on. But when you look at the meeting calendar, uh, when you look on the day, you can look at the agenda packet or the agenda or the video. But if you actually press on the date, you also have access to um, all of the documents that are more than 30 pages. Like for example, when I came on the afternoon to talk about the 1310, they had linked 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and 18 together, all as one item. And I thought I was gonna be able to comment for two minutes on each one. Anyway, on the binder that's outside, that was the generally available, there was about 270 pages on those five items but when I opened it up a different way there was more than 24 so I think it's interesting that you guys are adding another piece to that 2400 pages of information I'm just kind of stating that I, I I'll do some more research on that actual piece of land but thank you thank you anybody else during the public hearing in chambers specific to this item good morning welcome uh, good morning um I just have to say that nothing he said mattered. Um, he's a friend. Um, but if you have a cold, make some money and see. And um, that's all I have to say. Because I was supposed to have a bunch of people here earlier. And this is not a good Thank you for me. I apologize. All right. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us at the public hearing? Please. I'm the neighbor of the of Seth's, and he reviewed this with me, and I have no objection to it. I support it. Thank you. Thank you. For I'm coming. the only adjacent. Thing. It's Corey and myself are adjacent to it. It's parcel. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come down for the hearing. Are there any other members of the community that would like to address us during this public hearing on this item in chambers? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, we have speakers. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, over 20 years, I've gone to board of supervisors meeting in person um, until I got too much radiation with all the Wi-Fi, et cetera, and antennas on the roof. And I have seen numerous applications like this for timber production and looking at the overall picture uh, which includes applications like this the, the vast amount of trees that have been cut down since I moved here 40 years ago is just appalling and it's going on now everywhere. And the trees are the lungs of the earth. They provide habitat. And this should not be exempt from the CEQA. There are, of course, environmental damage from all this logging. Anyway, I'm opposed to all of this, you know, like clear cutting, degrading our county, uh, very disturbing. And I have a question. I have not seen before where there's an application and an ordinance on, on the same item. It seems to me the requirement should be when you're passing an ordinance, you have a second reading as this, let's see, schedule the ordinance for final adoption. That should be separate from an application. Could you explain this? This seems like an incorrect, um, maybe illegal procedure. 
please respond. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Are there any other callers on the on line? There are no further speakers, Chair. Mr. Dittmars, do you want to just address the question regarding the ordinance? Yeah, uh, my only comment is that this is standard practice for the timber production rezoning. And I'll just add that um, an ordinance that is the subject of a notice public hearing does not need to go through two readings according to law. Thank you, Council. We'll close public comment and close the public hearing and we'll bring it back to the board for action. Is there a motion on this item? No, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I this scene this uh, meets the planning and zoning criteria and the planning commission unanimously approved this. It does not uh, uh, involve clear cutting per se at all. So uh, I would move the recommended actions. We have a motion from Supervisor McPherson and a second from Supervisor Cummings. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Hernandez? Yes. McPherson? Aye. And Friend? Aye. And that item passes unanimously. And thanks for those that waited this morning for that item. We'll move on to item, thanks to Mr. DeMars, by the way, the, item eight, which is to conduct a study session on the draft sixth cycle housing element and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Deputy CAO, Director of Community Development and Infrastructure. We have the agenda board item, the housing element, um, as well as a number of the appendices associated with it. This morning, we are joined by a number of folks. We have um, Stephanie Hansen, our assistant director, Mark Connolly, the principal planner of policy, Susanna Ise, the principal planner of housing, as well as uh, Mr. Sun, as well as senior planning policy. I appreciate all of you coming for this item. We'll turn it over. I'm not sure who's kicking it off. So. Good morning and welcome back. Good morning, uh, Chair, Chair Friends, Supervisors. Thank you for having us here this morning. Um, we're here to present to you um, the draft 2023 housing element. Um, we have a staff presentation, then we'll have time for questions and public comment. Um, we have a number of folks here who have worked on this item, but we have a team of about 10 people and three consultants who have helped us get through uh, the draft and the, the process. Um, I just wanted to take a moment because we don't really address this exactly in the presentation, but the reason why we're here is because the state of California, our jurisdiction and other jurisdictions are in a housing crisis. And we need to find ways to accommodate more options for people to be able to rent in our community and purchase houses. As it stands now, my children won't be able to live in our county. And I think a lot of you um, also know that situation. So I just, as a precursor to what we're really trying to accomplish here, I wanted to offer that up and then I'm gonna turn it over to Mark to talk about the agenda. Good morning, Chair Friend and Board of Supervisors. The agenda we have for you this morning is we're going to first give you a little background uh, into the housing element and why we're doing this. We'll then go into a look of our community outreach and engagement that we performed. And then we're going to give you a little structure of what the housing element is and how it's formulated. And then something new to the six cycle housing element is an analysis of fair housing. So that's an interesting thing we'll go through with you today. Then we'll go through the major policies and programs that we uh, have, not all of them, just to highlight uh, mainly the new ones. And then we'll share with you the site inventories and uh, some of the rezone sites that we have. And then we'll just wrap everything up with letting you know what the next steps are. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Senior Planner, Matthew Sun. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors. Thank you, microphone might not be on. Testing, very good. Good morning, Chair and Supervisors. The housing element is one chapter in the County General Plan and must be updated every eight years. This year, it is due to the State of Department of Housing and Community Development by December 31st. The housing element is a policy document that must include actionable items, the implementation programs that the county will report progress on every year via the annual progress report. The element must also be accompanied by housing sites inventory. 
which shows that we can accommodate the assigned number of housing units specified in the regional housing needs allocation, commonly referred to as the RENA. The RENA is handed down to local governments by the state and the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, also known as AMBAG. Let's go to the next slide regarding community engagement. There, thank you. Following board direction, staff implemented a robust community engagement plan beginning in early 2023. Staff engaged a consultant who specializes in community engagement and who created two focus groups. The stakeholder group was comprised of representatives of businesses and community organizations that are involved in housing. And the citizens panel was comprised of residents who represented the county's demographics and those affected by the housing crisis. The full results of the stakeholder group and community panel meetings are included in Appendix C of the draft housing element. County staff also sought input from the public. Three public meetings were held this spring to solicit public input. The results of these three community meetings are also included in Appendix C of the housing element and reflect similar priority themes as the stakeholder group and community panel. Next slide, thank you. Here is a list of some of the top needs and solutions identified through the public engagement process. We found a lot of support for more multifamily housing at higher densities and heights, housing to address needs of the workforce, housing for teachers, and housing to accommodate people with disabilities. Next slide, please. The housing element contains the topical areas that meet the State Department of Housing and Community Development requirements. Section two contains the goals, policies, and programs critical to addressing housing and central to the element. The appendices support the housing element within, with maps, site inventory, review of the previous housing element, a fair housing report, and the results of the public engagement process. Next slide, please. The draft housing element has six goals. These goals address housing supply and direct new housing into infill areas of the county. For us, this means primarily within the urban services line, commonly referred to as the USL. Other goals, such as maintaining the stock and affordability of housing, equal opportunity to housing, housing for those with special needs, sustainability, and working with community partners are also addressed. Housing element requirements now include an assessment of fair housing practices, which incorporates an analysis of the relationship between available sites and areas of high or low resources and concrete actions in the form of programs to affirmatively further fair housing, providing housing opportunities in higher resourced unincorporated areas to accommodate higher density is key to meeting AFFH requirements. Appendix A of the housing element which contains a fair housing report, provides data and analysis to support the AFFH related programs, policies, and sites inventory. High resource attributes include proximity to transit, access to high performing schools and jobs, access to amenities such as parks and services, access to healthcare facilities and grocery stores, proximity to available infrastructure and utilities, sites that do not require environmental mitigation, and lastly, presence of development streamlining processes, environmental exemptions, and other development incentives. Next, thank you. This map created by the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee, or the TCAC, shows which areas of the county have more or fewer community resources. The map is used by TCAC to evaluate locations of housing projects that are seeking tax credits or development of lower income housing units. Communities must now consider these maps when preparing new sites inventories for their housing element updates in order to avoid locating most affordable housing in low resource areas. 
The blue areas on the map within the county's urban service line are moderate to higher resource areas where most community amenities, employment opportunities, and services are located. Much of the county's rural and agricultural areas are shown in light green, indicating that they are low resource areas, meaning that resources such as transit, schools, jobs, shopping, and other urban suburban amenities are not as widely available in these light green, green areas. Next slide, please. Proposed new programs, of course, this is a partial list. Many ongoing policies and programs that the county had in the fifth cycle will be retained in the new housing element. However, we wanted to highlight some of the newer programs that will be included. This list shows some of the new programs across all six goals in the element, many of which were suggested by participants in the community engagement process, such as H1F, which considers various updates to the development standards, including studying four to six story development in appropriate areas, such as major activity centers. Other programs address rezoning as necessary, code enforcement on vacation rentals, next a study on inclusionary housing and fees, housing for people with disabilities, and all electric housing. Next slide, please. In 2022, the county adopted the sustainability policy and regulatory update, a major overall of the county's general plan, zoning, and development standards. One of the main goals of the sustainability update was to allow more housing units and more housing options, especially along the county's major transportation corridors. The project included key changes in development standards, such as increasing the number of housing units that can be developed on each acre of land and zones that allow housing and adjusting codes to allow more units, creating a new zone called residential flex, which allows 22 to 45 units per acre and is the high end of the county's density range, allowing additional units in single family zones called the missing middle housing, rezoning some properties along transportation corridors and allowing more housing in mixed use projects in commercial zones. At this time, I pass on to Suzanne to address the housing sites inventory. Good morning, supervisors. This table shows the county's regional housing needs allocation, also referred to as the RENA, and also summarizes the site's inventory analysis. The site's inventory is a list of parcels in the county where new housing can be built with key data and estimates of how many units can be built on each triangle. The first column in this table shows that the county needs enough appropriately zoned land to accommodate 4,634 units across four income levels as shown on the table. State guidance suggests adding a buffer of at least 10% to provide more flexibility in case some sites are not developed with housing during the eight year planning period. We've included a 10% buffer in the second column of this table for a total of just over 5,000 units. The third column shows that the county's existing zoning and general plan applicable to the sites in the inventory provides capacity for 4,100 units, leaving a shortfall of nearly 1,000 units to get to the target number of 5,098. The numbers in this table reflect a conservative approach using minimum densities to estimate capacity of each site, unless more information was available from project applicants or staff for certain sites. Next slide, please. State guidance requires various factors to be considered in the site selection process and to estimate the number of units that can fit on each site. Zoning and general plan designations are some of the key factors considered in this process. Parcel size is another factor. Larger parcels are needed to accommodate most multifamily developments such as apartments, townhomes, and condo uh, condominium projects. And most affordable housing projects, uh, particularly those that provide housing affordable to lower income households, should be located in higher resource areas to meet the fair housing uh, goals of the element. Staff also considered factors such as site availability, owner intentions and pending projects. Next slide, please. 
This table summarizes a rezoning approach to meet the county's RENA. Staff estimates that the RENA shortfall could be accommodated by rezoning approximately 76 parcels distributed throughout the county's urbanized unincorporated areas. Uh, just over 1,800 units can be accommodated by rezoning approximately 30 larger parcels to urban high density or residential flex and by rezoning a few commercial properties from service commercial to a commercial zone that allows mixed use such as C1 or C2. Staff proposes rezoning the remaining 40 or so parcels using a recent law called SB 10 which allows jurisdictions to rezone uh, properties to allow infill of small missing middle housing projects, such as duplexes, triplexes, and quads in existing lower density neighborhoods. That rezoning approach creates capacity for another 375 units. Both multifamily housing and missing middle housing are badly needed in the county at this time to provide housing options for all people, including many local workers who need housing they can afford near their workplace. Accommodating the arena for lower income units is key to achieving a, a compliant housing element. Most lower income units uh, tend to be in unsubsidized projects, which are likely to have units at various affordability levels, so the yield projections for most sites also include units in the moderate or above moderate categories, except for sites that are known to be proposed for 100% affordable um, subsidized housing projects, which would be uh, projected as all lower income units. Next slide, please. This map shows the general distribution of sites in the housing inventory, most of which are infill sites within the urban services line. More detailed maps are provided in your packet and also online in Appendix F to the draft element. Blue and purple shading on this map indicates parcels that are already zoned for housing that have capacity for additional units. Yellow shading shows the sites proposed for rezoning. In some cases, uh, while an entire parcel may be shaded yellow, in some cases, only a portion of that site is proposed to be rezoned. Consistent with the sustainability update and the factors noted earlier, most housing is best accommodated near transportation corridors and other urban services, in existing neighborhoods and business districts, in areas without environmental constraints, in areas that help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions and plan for climate change. Because we're focusing on infill opportunities in the unincorporated areas within the urban services line, the proposed rezonings are in districts one, two, and four, because the other two districts don't have unincorporated areas within the USL. Next slide, please. This slide shows the existing and proposed uh, rezoning sites in the Aptos area. Uh, in particular, if you'll notice on the Seascape golf, cars, golf course parcels, uh, only the black cross has hatched portions of those two parcels, which cover the existing surface parking lot for the clubhouse are proposed to be rezoned. Next slide, please. This map shows the existing uh, and proposed rezoning sites in the South County area outside the city of Watsonville. And now I'd like to hand it back to Mark Connolly. Thank you, Suzanne. To summarize, here are the next steps coming in the adoption process. After today's study session, we'll have a, a study session at the Planning Commission. We visited the Housing Advisory Commission last week on the 6th. We're expecting a set of comments from the state by October 23rd, and we're finalizing the CEQA document now. We'll then be back for the start of the public hearings, ending with an adoption hearing before the board on November 15th. This hearing would be an adoption hearing of the housing element, but the rezoning hearings wouldn't begin until an implementation that would start next year. Just to acknowledge, if the county's housing element is not deemed compliant by the state deadline, the county could lose eligibility for various state funding programs for housing 
transportation, and other local needs. Also, housing projects with at least 20% lower income units may be exempt from county zoning and general plan policies until that element is in compliance. And that is pursuant to state law. That's commonly known as builder's remedy. So with that, that concludes our presentation. We thank you very much and can answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your presentation. I'm sure each board member will have comments on this. Uh, Supervisor McPherson, or is it okay if we begin with you? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think we're discussing probably the biggest challenge this board or this county is going to have for the next six years to more than triple our requirement under RENA. Uh, we've discussed this before. It's going to be a very, very long, uh, long haul. But I, I would like to really thank our planning staff for the study session today and I, what you're going to be facing in the near future. Uh, this is uh, a great amount of work and it's really detailed and it really gives a great, <clears throat> excuse me, give us a great outline of what we need to do. I especially want to acknowledge the um, effort to include additional opportunities for housing along the rail corridor. Um, I asked for our staff for more than a year ago to make sure we identify as many opportunities as possible to uh, develop housing along the rail corridor as this is how we will best position us on ourselves for the state and federal funding that was mentioned. Uh, and those funding sources look um, look for population density and ridership, uh, transportation uh, of all modes uh, as imperative conditions before we move ahead. In terms of my fifth district, and, and as we was mentioned, the third district as well, we're not in the urban services line. Uh, with the exception of the city of Scotts Valley, building ADUs, um, junior ADUs and tiny homes represent the most feasible way to, that we're gonna be able to expand our housing stock uh, as I see it. But still the, the constraints are considerable. We have one acre minimums, we have water issues, geological concerns up in the San Lorenzo Valley in particular. Uh, the cost of an of enhanced septic tanks, as we've seen in uh, after the fires, uh, and the building and maintaining roads for fire access and equipment, uh, and dealing with the geological conditions, as I mentioned before, throughout the mountains are are really huge barriers. And I don't want to make make this an excuse for the fifth district. It's just a fact. And I uh, I, I know that uh, some people in that district are concerned with the impact that this might have, but overall countywide, I think this represents a great effort, a really great effort to meet uh, what the requirements set by the state, especially for affordable units. And I know that uh, previously there were some board members that said we should s separate this equally among the five five uh, fire, um, supervisorial districts, but but that's just not going to happen. So. Uh, it's a big challenge to more than triple what we have done the previous eight years. Um, and I think um, that we have some things that th this county has wanted historically, Measure J and its limitations of 1978 nine, uh, in the city of Santa Cruz, uh, which is doing a phenomenal job of building more housing downtown. Um, but um, you're protecting uh, agriculture lands, as I mentioned, uh, the fifth district uh, impacts and limitations we have that are in place and uh, not being within the urban services line. So I, uh, I really wanna say congratulations on a tremendous presentation of how we can hope to get uh, to the target that the state has put on us uh, in the arena numbers. Uh, it's a job very well done and uh, much appreciated. It's going to be a huge challenge for this county to, in the unincorporated area to meet the criteria and the numbers that the state wants us to have in the next eight years. Thank you, Supervisor Koenig. Thank you, Chair. I also want to thank planning staff. I know this has been a uh, quite the sprint to get this done this year, especially coming off the heels of uh, the sustainability update, the largest change to our general plan in over 25 years, which this board approved at the end of last year. So uh, from I don't know, maybe out of the frying pan into the fire. Um, in any case, it's important. I think it's, it's clear now to see that uh, the work we did with the sustainability update has set us up to be successful in accomplishing this housing element. Um, I also want to thank you guys for being so responsive to the public's initial feedback. The maps and inventory lists are a lot easier to read now uh, with the updates that include addresses and everything. Um, 
Uh, also, of course, all of the work that you've done with public outreach is really impressive. And again, I know you had to launch that very quickly at the beginning of this year uh, with the, the board's direction for that to be representative and deliberative. And I think you did a commendable job. Uh, Supervisor McPherson said this is an incredibly important planning document that's going to shape our community for uh, years to come. I mean, certainly the next eight years as we try to accomplish all this housing construction, um, but certainly beyond that as well. Um, and, you know, I, given the constraints we have in this county, I totally understand and accept that the majority of this new housing uh, will and should be in the urban core of the unincorporated county where people do have access uh, to grocery stores on foot or doctors or gyms or schools or any other of those facilities. Uh, and where we also have the best chance of providing a frequent transit service. Um, so of course that does mean that a lot of it ends up in the first district. Um, which, you know, again, I think it'll ultimately lead to a better quality of life for, um, you know, not just new residents to our county, but the existing residents who maybe finally have adequate housing. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, the first is, and clearly we are relying uh, on our new highest density uh, zoning designation, residential flex in a number of, for, for, for many of these rezone parcels. Um, but we're still waiting for the Coastal Commission to actually review the sustainability update where we created that designation. Does that create any kind of legal conflict where we could submit this to HCD and say, well, we're going to do all this with this zoning designation and it just isn't in effect yet? We had the same concerns. Um, uh, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, we actually did talk to the state about it. Um, uh, just like with the rezonings where we have three years, if, if everything goes well, um, we have three years to do that. Um, we also have time in the program to actually implement the things that we need to implement to get there. So the state knows, for instance, with rezonings, it's not done yet, but it will be done as a part of the program. Um, despite the fact that the Coastal Commission this week approved a year long extension to that, uh, to getting that uh, sustainability update item to hearing, we're working very closely with the staff they are aiming for a December hearing. Um, and so hopefully we will get there quicker rather than later next year. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the second question is in regards to um, the many SP10 rezonings. You know, some of the greatest hope we have for adding more housing capacity quickly is all the advances in modular housing, um, both stacked and also, um, you know, just kind of individual units that you can drop on the ground. Um, and now uh, I understand there might be some challenges with our existing definition of multifamily housing. I mean, does it have, is it, am I correct in understanding that multifamily housing has to actually share a wall between multiple units? Um, so not necessarily. So I think there may be some confusion based on some of the existing um, uh, language in our current zoning ordinance, which is a uh, prior to the sustainability update changes. Um, but basically there's different jargon for housing development and different groups of people use it a little differently. So there's attached, semi-attached and detached housing, right? Um, and then there's multifamily. What multifamily means is it can be all attached. It could be all units in one building, but it could also be multiple units on the same parcel that share an APN. So like you can think of them, sometimes they call them little senior cottage developments or dwelling groups. So there's different ways to get it multifamily. Um, they don't necessarily have to be attached. I think there's some wording in our, some of our zoning district where it talks about different levels of review if, if a proposal comes in and it's either lower than the available density on that site or if it's sort of the wrong product type where it should be either semi-attached or attached if it's in some of a higher density multifamily zones. And part of the reason for that is you can't really take advantage of that density if all the units are detached, right? You're you're only going to be doing right. like 10 or 12 units an acre at most if they're all detached. Right. No, of course. But so so if I'm hearing you correctly, the um the SB10 rezonings would still allow for cottage type sure. development. Okay, great. Depends on the parcel size and what the owner wants to achieve. Right. Okay, well, we'll have to look at that more closely just to make sure there's not any uh, thing that could hang us up in terms of, I don't know, requirements from setbacks from internal roads or other things to just make sure that those kinds of projects can move forward. 
Um, those are all my questions for now. Thank you again. Thank you, Supervisor Cummings. First, I just wanted to start by um, thanking the staff for their work on developing the draft housing element that's before us today. I know it's been a lot of work with incorporating all the feedback from the community and trying to, um, you know, make sense of all of it and get it in a document that we can send off to the state. And so just want to appreciate all the work that staff has done, um, you know, because this is a serious attempt at trying to meet the state requirements. And I hope uh, HCD is going to treat it as, as such. Um, in particular, I do want to appreciate the revisions that staff included to strength, to strengthen our commitment to affordable housing and tenant protections. Um, and I do have some um, further recommendations that I'll bring up in a second, because as we all know, Santa Cruz County is facing a serious affordability crisis. We're the most expensive uh, rental community in the entire United States, and we have some of the most expensive real estate markets in the entire world. Um, the housing prices are excessive and burdensome for our low and moderate and middle income families. And um, we really need to try to do everything we can to maximize the production of that housing. Um, and there really are only two ways that we can, you know, act to ease this crisis in affordability. One is to support the construction of subsidized housing developments for low and very low income people. Um, the other is that we require market rate housing to provide affordable units as part of the development. Um, right now, the county's inclusionary ordinance requires the 15% of the units uh, have um, the 15 percent of the units in market rate residential development are affordable. Um, however, there's some serious limitations. Um, for example, the state density bonus law uh, prohibits applying affordability requirements on density bonus units. So while um, the number of units in development can be increased to 35 or 50 percent of developers request, the total number of units don't even meet that 15 percent level. And so trying to address that in terms of production of affordable housing um, really needs to be something that we focus on. Um, and so and the other thing I want to point out, too, is that, you know, with all of the streamlining, uh, that's happening around housing production, density bonus laws, the elimination of parking. Uh, we're really incentivizing the developers to build housing, but we are not seeing that reflected in the cost of housing. And so um, I think is one of the things that we should be moving forward is really prioritizing and increasing the affordable housing that's in new developments and eliminating the fees that allow developers to actually not produce the affordable housing on site. Um, that's something that, you know, in terms of meeting those requirements, we need to make sure that developers are actually producing the affordable housing if we're going to meet um, our target housing goals. And so um, at a point when this comes back, I'd, I'd like to propose some suggestions, knowing that we as a board haven't had an opportunity to really weigh in on this prior to this getting sent to HCD. And I'd like to make a few suggestions um, that maybe can be incorporated when we hear back and that we can see reflected when this comes back to the board for final adoption and then prior to when it goes before the planning commission. I can, I don't know if it's going to, if there's public comment. Yeah, no, I mean, not as a motion, but do you want to introduce some of the concepts so the board can discuss what your sure. interests are? Um, as part of the H3H program that it be revised to include, include the following components, updates the affordable housing fee for residential developments, project size thresholds that trigger inclusionary requirements, affordability levels for inclusionary units, and harmonizing the inclusionary program with state density bonus law. Um, in addition to that, the replace, another uh, issue that comes up is around the replacement of affordable housing. So when we see affordable units get demolished, how those are replaced. Um, and so the replacement of affordable housing units demolished as a result of larger new developments shall not be counted as part of any inclusionary housing, but should be in addition to them so that we see those units get replaced. And in addition to that, we see the inclusionary units come on board from the new development. Um, as another part of H3H, in order to encourage additional affordable housing units and to provide an incentive to density bonus projects, inclusionary housing requirements for projects of 10 units or greater shall be increased to 20%. And for 50% density bonus projects, the inclusionary requirement shall be 25%. And so exploring the possibility of us being able to do that with the state density bonus law, I think would be something worth including. And then the lastly, because of changes in the housing market regarding financing of rent, rental projects, making such developments more financially feasible, the inclusionary ordinance shall require on-site provision of all inclusionary units unless impact fees are approved by the decision-making body, such as provided in section 1710034C. And I have copies of this I can pass around to folks so they can take a look at it. Okay, we can discuss that more in a, in a second. Supervisor Hernandez. 
I'll be brief. I just want to thank also staff for all their work and doing their their uh, community meetings as well throughout the county. I know if it's one thing we really do need um, housing and both affordable housing and workforce housing. You know, there's been uh, prior to the pandemic in South County, we used to have actually housing that went in the high 500s and 600s, and that is non-existent anymore. We've had a lot of folks uh, from both that have been affected by the CCU fires just and weren't able to build or rebuild come over down to Watsonville and purchase these homes. A lot of folks from from uh, Santa Cruz and uh, mid count or Santa Cruz mostly. And, you know, with the pandemic and work from home situation, they have driven up home prices in, in South County up to 800,000 to a million dollars. So what was once considered the affordable part of the county is no longer affordable. And it's moving folks from Watsonville further out into Hollister, Castroville, Los Banos, uh, and you know, the further parts of the state. And so it's definitely something that we have to address to, you know, build both affordable housing and, you know, and, and I think that's, it's, it's relative, right? Of what's considered affordable in Santa Cruz and what's considered affordable in Watsonville. Um, it's, you know, we used to have prior to the pandemic, a median income of 41,000 in South County and in closer to 100,000 in Santa Cruz. So it's very different. And so what's considered affordable to buy a home is very different in South County. So th those are the kind of situations that, that I think have to be ad addressed. And I, well, I think some of the things that Justin was mentioning would, would address those things as well. But I mean, those are the things that we're facing. And so it's like, I, I think and commend all the work that you guys are doing. It's one of the, you know, biggest challenges that we're facing. So thank you. Thank you. I've had some comments and some questions associated with this as well. Also appreciation for the work that went in, also appreciation for, for all the time that the planning commission has spent on this. So a significant amount of time and input was spent uh, there. Before I get into spe specifics on the housing element, I, uh, my colleague had presented some ideas such as, uh, in essence, the elimination of the in lieu. Are, are a lot of developers or any developers still using the in lieu component or is it because the board had considered it as a pilot? My understanding is that we'd sort of move from that, but is it is it still being used as a primary tool? I can speak to that. So um, some of you may recall, I believe it was 2018 or 2019, we updated uh, several county code sections, including portions of the zoning code, uh, the density bonus chapter, as well as the inclusionary chapter 1710. And at that time, we changed the policy for the in-lieu fees so that they have to seek the board's permission, or if it's a small project and it's only going to the planning commission, the planning commission's uh, permission in order to uh, be able to do entirely in lieu fees. Um, and we've only had one project since that time actually pay fees. And that was really because of extreme financial hardships that happened with this really quick run up and basically doubling or tripling of interest rates over a six month period. So um, it was really an exception. Staff would not normally recommend that the board approve that option unless there was some hardship situation like that uh, that was, you know, putting the development in a situation of facing, you know, foreclosure or something like that. But so we really haven't had any other developments use the uh, the hundred percent fee option. Now, that said, the way our ordinance works is, we no longer round the inclusionary percentage up to the next whole unit. What they can do is they put the number of whole, whole number of affordable units in the project. And if there's a remaining fraction, they can pay a fee, what we call a fractional in lieu fee for that remaining fraction of a unit, or they can opt to just round up and provide one extra unit. So that they have a choice about, but that's kind of tinkering around the edges. That's not putting fees for the whole project. Okay. I mean, it seems like this would be a redundant action from what is already I believe in place, so. yes. uh, number four anyway. Um, I, I just in a secondary question, I, I mean, there's, there's probably, I don't know if it's ideological or scientific on the percentage of what the inclusionary number should be. I think the board's goal is to build, uh, is to ensure that the most 
number of units are built, and in particular, most number of affordable housing units are built. My concern is adding any additional burdens on that may actually have the inverse effect of reducing overall affordable housing. So do we have a sense, and also normally there should be, historically they used to have to do uh, justification studies on, on these kinds of numbers, et cetera, which this doesn't state, it just is providing additional direction to include this in. So make sure that my understanding is correct on the law, on nexus studies associated with affordability and whether there's any sort of understanding of baseline thresholds that actually starts to decrease the total amount of affordable housing because I, I have a reservation of increasing a baseline number if it's going to mean less housing will get built in this category. So we do actually have a, prog a program, I believe the commissioner mentioned, I'm sorry, the supervisor mentioned the program in the document currently, which is to do an updated nexus study and economic feasibility study of our current inclusionary program and consider any options for improvements that people might want to suggest. So I believe the supervisor's suggestions already fit and are covered by that existing program. Um, it is a requirement under state law now since um, some new bills were passed, I think I want to say 2015, um, that if any community in California wants to increase a mandatory inclusionary requirement above 15%, um, there's sort of what you want to do to be safe. And then there's the bare minimum of what the state requirement is. So the state doesn't strictly require us to do a nexus study, but it does give the state uh, housing and community development department the ability to request from us an economic feasibility study of our program if we place that number above 15%. So it's sort of like a safe harbor number, you could consider it at 15% and below. Um, and so that's why we've developed this program because we have heard these suggestions from some community members and we've basically built the program in to study this and commission those required studies to be ready if the community wants to make any significant changes to the program. And okay, Chair, I'm sorry, if, I might, please. if I might add, um, we actually did, we had the state um, HCD representatives reviewing our element come out and visit us. We got a van and took them around to different sites and, um, Along the way, we got to talk a little bit about some of the programs they were interested in, you know, where the pain points might be, um, what might be difficult. And we did bring this one up. They, um, they're they very clear about frowning upon anything above 15%. They view it as um, uh, something that does not help our housing along, that um, housing developments would not be encouraged by it. So we think the right approach here is a little bit of a balancing act is to study it and see what the results of the study are. And that way we have um, good background information that if we are going to do any changes or increases, we have a formalized study to back that up. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I've got some questions specific now to the housing element. Um, there was a slide earlier that talked about some of the community input and some of the preferences of the community house, including like senior housing or teacher workforce housing. My understanding is that there's no way through the element to specifically discriminate for or against any sort of subpopulation, correct? So even though there was an actual community request that the housing be used for certain purposes, there's no way for us to actually dictate that, that be the case. Yeah, it's um, more about providing the different options. Um, higher density provides smaller units that can be great for the workforce. You don't always need uh, large family units. You often have singles and seniors. Um, so it's more about um, providing those options kind of by design than you know, definitely saying this is for the workforce. There are um, options though for workforce housing. Um, where specific um, school districts or, or developers on their properties have some options on on who will be renting right. from them. So, um, like, but I don't think that's something we want to necessarily build into the element. Something we don't necessarily want to do or we can't legally do. Those are two different issues. Um, we have no zoning mechanism to put in place to require senior housing or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but besides that public facilities housing that really does speak or public facility zoning that really does speak to um, providing for workforce housing, we do have we do have that in place already. Okay, I mean, which explains like St. Stephen's for example and their ability to do that. So to that end, um, as we've had previous discussions from 
the sustainable Santa Cruz plan when we um, you know, held community meetings, it seems like a long time ago now at the Grange and such and Aptos, the, the highest profile locations in, in my district, in particular the par three property is it's sort of colloquial known, uh, the old golf course there, the old par three golf course. And at that time, I mean, it's zoned for parks and recreation. Um, the feedback and the understanding from the community was would be that it would be a uh, either a, an assisted living or senior facility, which is we desperately need. And then the second part of it would continue to be uh, a harmonizing park space that could be used by uh, those that are rehabilitating there, including Soco Creek Water had talked about creating a retention pond or lake there that could be used to help charge the aquifer. We had extensive discussions about this. As you recollect over a decade ago, there was a pretty significant housing proposal there that that ended up failing at the board level. And then that's what led to this secondary discussion because of ingress and egress challenges through there. Um, my concern with what's proposed because we don't have the ability to specify senior housing, we just less than a month ago received a pretty significant study about the need for senior housing in our community and the growing of our community um, is that we're functionally replacing one type of community need with another type of community need on the same parcel as a result of of what we're doing in the housing element. Um, and I don't see a way for the board to specify um, that preference, even though that is not just my preference, it's the community commitment that was made during sustainable, which we're relying on as the baseline EIR for this anyway. I mean, so this was the discussion that was used and the community commitment that was made. Um, this actually doubles the amount of proposed units that had been proposed there 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Uh, so I wanted to ask a question about, um, because we have a 10% buffer number that we've gone to an extra 900 something units, and these are two parcels. And the concept had always been to maintain, uh, well, to rezone something there, to allow something to happen there, like a assisted living facility or senior facility and still have some uh, parks element. Could we not uh, do a split zoning on the par three property or just rezone one of the two parcels, which would still be 200 something of the 400 proposed units. We'd still be well over the HCD requirements. We'd be slightly below the 10% uh, you know, pad that is recommended, but not required, it sounds like. Uh, so walk me through why that, uh, if that's possible and, and uh, how we can go through that. So in terms of the buffer, I can just say that um, it's part of the guidance, the official state guidance. So they put out a memo, it's like 20 some odd pages it's just saying what you have to do. So, you know, whether it's recommended or required, I would say it kind of feels like it's required to have at least a 10% buffer. So they give communities an option. You can either take the lowest end of the buffer range, which would be 10%, and use a very uh, modest approach to projecting yield, unit yield on each site, which is what we've done. Or you can use a higher percentage buffer and use a, a more ambitious way to project unit yield. So I'll give you an example. Let's say in our urban high zone, that that actually it's not a zone, it's a general plan designation. That allows a range of 11 to 30 units an acre. That's a pretty wide range. 11 units an acre is really a single family density. Um, based on this state guidance, we had to use 11 units an acre to project uh, unit yields for most parcels in that type of general plan designation, unless there was countervailing evidence such as a pending application with a different number of units or so forth. So that's what they mean by using a conservative approach to estimating unit yield. Um, it's only because we took that conservative approach that we're basically going to be able to hopefully get approved with just a 10% buffer. If we um, you know, were to project density or unit yields in the middle of that range, so for example, it's something like 20 units an acre instead of 11, um, we would need even more of a buffer. Um, so, you know, staff is trying to follow the guidance as best we can to maximize our chances of getting this housing element certified by the state. Um, so, you know, if we were to say we're only going to do a 5% buffer, I worry that they might not certify us. 
Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't equate to a 5% buffer is what I'm saying. I mean, just mathematically, it, yeah. it wouldn't. But but my point, though, is that I'm looking for some more creative solutions sure. that were presented to me on these two parcels. I, I'm confident that there's going to be community concern about this that may delay this implementation anyway. And in order to land, in order to smooth that over, since the goal here is to have something certified, the goal is to not end up in a builder's remedy situation. The goal here is to also meet the commitment we made to the community not that long ago on the document that's predi that we're predicating this other document on. I'd like to see a way on these parcels to um, not have the size and scope as proposed and also to, to, to the least degree possible, specify the preference of the board that the senior housing be provided. I mean, I, that's that's been something that's been committed to. And so that, that's where my concern is. Sorry, Supervisor Koenig. Your, your question, I mean, so my understanding is we sort of a proven concept, the rezonings for the housing element, but the specific yeah. rezonings actually will come back to the board in the future one by one. So, I mean, at the point that we were considering these two sites, and couldn't, can we, can't, can't we put in some kind of, uh, I don't know, I guess a deed restriction would be after agreed to by the, the owner themselves, or like, can we make it a condition that a deed restriction for 55 plus housing be added in order to achieve this rezoning or something to that effect? Oh, Suzanne would probably speak to this better than I can, but that would in part depend on what the property owner is proposing and what the conditions are that um, the planning commission and the board see it at, at, at the time. Um, you know, I think there, there, there could be an option for kind of like we did on the, uh, the other golf course site of rezoning portion of it. Maybe there's a portion of that site that remains in open space and lessen it a little bit. Um, uh, however, if we're going to lose the units there, we're just making our very low income number by one unit. Like, and that's dependent on, as we said in the presentation, on developers who are also providing, you know, higher level um, income units and portion of their of those projects would go into that lower income category. So we, we're very mindful of the fact that we're just squeaking above the line there. So really to stick with that 10% uh, buffer and make sure we can accommodate those very low income units, we probably would have to find other locations to rezone to make up for the loss. And I think we we should look at that. I mean, that's, and I, I, I understand what Supervisor Cohen, I appreciate by the way, what you're saying right now that it will come back. This is the time to have these discussions though, because this sets the expectation of both county staff and the state of understanding what will or will not happen on those parcels. And so I think now is the right time uh, to do that. I mean, we have the, this is almost 13 acres. I mean, we have the ability as two parcels, but I mean, it's, they're connected. I mean, we have the ability to say that some of that acreage won't, will stay in the, in the, not open space per se, but it will stay within the parks and recreation space. The goal was to use the development to fund another park there, which by the way, I think would probably be an essential amenity. There are, there's no other park over there uh, for whatever that community may be. Historically, we had said it would be a senior housing. I understand we can't have that specific deed restriction, but I, um, I, I let me put it this way. I'm in favor of the entire housing element, except for this proposal. Uh, right. And so what I I'm, I'm asking here, and it's not an unreasonable ask, this is my district and it's a historically high profile location, right? That, we work together here to try and come to a place that uh, uh, I can easily communicate to the community as to why, because we're, we're already communicating to the community they need to have some sort of housing there. That's not, that's established. Um, but how about this? I, I don't want to have to make a decision based on the fact that you're just barely meeting the number. Like that's not, that that's a false choice for us as policymakers that, that throughout the entire system, that it's all now coming down to this situation. So, um, my preferences would be the direction would be on this that there be a preservation of of some of the space for the parks usage and that uh, we have a commentary non-binding i understand but the non ex expectation that that uh the preference and outreach into the community be that this still be preserved for senior or, or some sort of assisted living because there's there's an unquestionable need for it and it would still meet our our, our hcd requirements 
and there a lot of the community outreach over the during sustainable is specific to that issue and i have a concern that we're pulling that back to non-specificity i would just like to clarify that um senior housing is fine we have codes in our um zoning code right now that allow for what they call congregate senior housing and things like that but assisted living facilities do not count toward the arena their sure. beds, their um, people are admitted under admissions agreements, not leases. So they don't give you tenure as a renter or owner. So they don't count as housing. In Thank you, Ms. Nisa, for that clarification. I'm, I'm fine with the senior housing component of it. Um, I don't even know how we meet the covenant of what we just had a study session on one month ago, unless we actually start having, I mean, <laughs> uh, unless we specify these kinds of things. So what would your suggestion, I, I've, I've thrown out my desires, but I'm not the priming professional here. Um, so what would your professional recommendation than be on these locations for that? Well, I, I completely agree that with this 13 or 14 acre site, um, there's a lot of great opportunities for uh, approaching a master plan on the site and providing a good amount of open space and protecting that. I think any projects that were to come in to us would be required to provide a significant amount of open space. And the more that the projects can go vertical, the more footprint of the site can be preserved for open space and other amenities. So I don't think there's any conflict there. And, you know, the housing element is really a policy document. We're not at this point in time really needing to engage in site planning issues or, you know, responding to development proposals. We're not even at the zoning stage. Um, I think there can certainly be communicated that the neighborhood has an interest in seeing some of that housing be senior housing. But um, as a fair housing matter, I don't think we can zone for it or as a county preclude the uh, owner or applicants from proposing all age housing because that would be kind of discriminatory based on age or familial status, which is not something we can do as a public mm -hmm. agency. So um, communicating desires, intent, all of that kind of thing can be done with a future applicant, but I don't think we want to put a deed restriction or, uh, you know, zone or age. Right. Nothing that was just communicated to me, though, establishes that that'll happen in five years. So what I what I want to be able to say in this during this planning process, whether it ends up, I, I mean, I started this conversation asking the question about whether we could put it in was told no, so I get it. Um, but you just said that there would be a guarantee of open space. How would I how would I know that? That's not put anywhere. That's that's just what you're saying to me right now. I want something that would be that this board is saying that in these two parcels because of community commitment that, and one of them is a split zoning option, right? I mean, one is that we just say, I'm taking five acres off of it. And then I know, guaranteed, right? I mean, there's two, well, one of them is five acres. That one of the two parcels shall not be rezoned. It could be something this board does. And and yes, there's a, a density or height change to the second parcel, but maybe that solves at least the second component of it. The first part of it then would be, I think it should be stated as we um, move forward in this study session that the board wanted it to be used for a certain purpose, even if it's not specified in the housing element that it was such because there's the difference between a preference and a legal requirement right and that's where uh i was hoping you would you would help me land i mean so does that make sense what you say sure and I, I i was referring to in our zoning code we have open space requirements for residential development so the more units you have the more open space per unit you have to have and that can be a combination of both common area open space and individual unit open space that may or may not be enough for what you have in mind, but I right. just, that's what I was commenting okay. on. And it's it's not, I mean, just to be, yeah. it's not, right? So, because we're literally rezoning something that's designated for parks and was it was historically had been, and we're saying we're going to remove that. So I don't think a common area green space meets that criteria of the historic commitment to the community on that. So I, I think that maybe the best option here, I mean, because I haven't been convinced otherwise, is to do a split zone, is to only read, is to say that this shall be limited to one of the two, the larger of the two, the seven or eight acre, unless you can come up with, or that it shall be limited to a certain percentage of the total two acres, maybe 60% or 70% uh, in order to do that. I think if we, we try to go down this road, we should talk about a percentage of open space. Um, the world has changed since we did the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. I believe that site was designated for commercial. In, in the plan, um, both parcels are 
uh, parks and recreation. And I, I think what we do is try to work on a way um, to, to dictate the, that a percentage of the site of both parcels. Using both parcels as a single site, a percentage of that site would be dedicated to open space and then, you know, let the, the housing component play out according to, to the zoning. Uh, just trying to offer some helpful ideas here. I mean, could we could put some kind of public park easement on the, the property or something like that to assure that if the, the open space created would be accessible by the community. And I certainly hear what you're saying. It, it probably as far as the plan unit development at being able to use both of the sites together is going to probably ultimately yield the best park, assuming we have, you know, that requirement because, you know, it allows you to whatever, put it closer to the existing homes or in a way that's more accessible than just kind of A or B, one parcel or the other. But um, I mean, yeah, would some kind of public access easement help satisfy the requirement? Idea, we can study that for sure. Um, you know, I think, I think that part of the discussion that we're not having here is that County has very few large sites, right? 13 acres is a huge opportunity for us to provide some housing, especially affordable housing. Hopefully a portion would be senior housing, that kind of thing. But we, we just don't have that many opportunities. And so this, while, while there may have been discussions about this property in the past, I really feel like this large property along the highway is it is a distinct opportunity for us to build more housing in our community. So I just want to kind of put that balance out there. Yeah, well, Ms. Hansen, we're proposing building hundreds of units there. So I think we satisfy that comment. The question is how we harmonize those hundreds of units with um, the needs of the new residents, which currently currently aren't being taken into consideration to with historic conversations with the community, which I think our word is the county actually matters. We have these community meetings. Half of your document talks about the community input you received in this thing. So clearly it's used as a leverage tool to justify policymaking. And so I, I want to honor the fact that not that many years ago, we had pretty significant communications with the community, uh, community meetings that I've had um, with some of your predecessors anyway in these roles on these issues. So I, I think that the, all those things matter, right? I mean, there isn't an, uh, something that matters more. And what we're talking about is still building a lot of units there. Uh, the question is where and how, um, who gets served there, and what can make still the, the broader community value there. Um, so I feel like, and I apologize that I'm monopolizing this entire conversation, but this is the opportunity that's come to us to do so. And I think it's time to open it up for the community, but when it comes back, I, I still need some resolution associated with this. Um, not right resolution, but direction, because obviously we are still, this is an iterative document that things are changing. Um, and I think we can do that. So we'll open it up for the community as part of this study session. Is there anybody in chambers that would like to address us on this item? Good morning and welcome. Good morning, members of the board. I um, My name is Sandy Brown. I am here in my capacity as a member of the Santa Cruz City Council this morning. Um, I felt moved to speak in response to some of the discussion that came from Chair Friend's questions about the inclusionary, how to handle the inclusionary zoning provisions of, for the county in your housing element. And um, so I just want to, and, and the question about ideological versus scientific <laughs> um, uh, um, rationale for um, for making a decision in this regard is is apt. I think I, you know it's it's very hard to find. Uh, I'm a social scientist, and I have not seen any data to confirm one way or another. Um, we have studies uh, that suggest kind of different ways that this is handled um, or or that it plays out, excuse me. Um, but what I want to say is that we do have some anecdotal evidence from two jurisdictions here within the county. Uh, the city of Watsonville and the city of Santa Cruz both have 20% uh, inclusionary uh, housing, affordable housing rate in their, uh, their local ordinances. And um, I can't speak in particular to the Watsonville experience, but it was helpful for us at the city of Santa Cruz when in 2019, we voted to increase that inclusionary rate to 20%. At the time, um, we were told a study was needed. Uh, we couldn't do it without one. 
we said with the political will, we think we can. We did it. Um, it did not, in fact, affect housing development applications. We have seen more than ever um, post uh, implementing that 20%. And essentially, if you leave your uh, inclusionary rate at 15%, what you're going to end up getting is like between 9 and 11% affordable in those density bonus projects. So I would really encourage you to think about having the political will, if you care about affordable housing, to move forward um, and make that commitment to try to, to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown, for speaking on that item. Is there anybody else who'd like to address this in chambers? Madam Clerk, is there anybody online? Yes, we have speakers online. Call in user one, your microphone is now available. Marilyn Garrett, good suggestion by Sandy Brown there. It seems uh, we have quite a few unjust laws that favor big developers and doesn't really how provide for housing the unhoused at all. I think of the bumper sticker I used to have, and I'm a retired teacher. It will be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. We have over half of our taxpayer money going towards military operations, 800 military bases the U.S. has all over the world, um, and billions to Ukraine arms manufacturers from this country. Food, not bombs, says it, doesn't it? We need food, not bombs. Housing, not bombs. Schools, not bombs. And quoting the co-founder of Food Not Bombs, Keith McHenry, in an article, The Logic of Letting Millions of Americans Move On to the Streets. This is from September 2021. But there is plenty of money in the state's coffers to make sure no Californians are forced to live outside. In June 2021, Governor Newsom reported there was around $75 billion surplus, yet these funds have failed to provide rent relief or provide housing for the unhoused. According to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, it would cost $20 billion to end homelessness in the United States. That's you, quite Garrett. a figure. We need to shift the funds. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Is there anybody else online? Yes. Rafa, your microphone is now available. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Rafa Sunfeld. I live in Santa Cruz. Um, I was just uh, calling to comment on uh, the county's uh, efforts around the housing element. Um, particularly uh, 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 with development last week that uh, the Coastal Commission could be delaying the implementation of the sustainability update for up to a year. Um, uh, it's really critical that uh, the county include a program in its housing element to uh, implement that local coastal plan change at uh with the the coastal commission and the reason why is that the densities that the housing element relies on on the site inventory are all based on the land use element density updates that were passed by the county through the sustainability plan and while the county has passed those those uh density changes, my understanding is that those aren't actually implemented until the LCP is approved by the Coastal Commission. Um, so so at, at this point, um, you know, my belief is that the entire site inventory relies on densities that aren't actually legal at this point because the Coastal Commission hasn't approved them. And um, until the Coastal, Co Coastal Commission does sign off on those higher density uh, uh, land use element uh, uh, components, um, we we basically have to treat the LCP as a mandatory rezoning under our 
uh, housing element. And um, and we should be uh, committing to that in the housing element. Uh, we're already doing it anyway. Uh, it's just important that we stick to our principles and include the LCP revision as a policy in the housing element. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. There are no further speakers, Chair. I see there is an additional person in chambers, please. Thank you, Becky Steinberger. I'm sorry that I missed the presentation. I was in a proceeding in the courtroom. But I did attend the County Housing Advisory Commission meeting last week and saw the information, some information presented. It was a very good discussion amongst the commissioners. Um, my question at that time that didn't get answered was what is uh, happening with the what was going to be the Kaiser uh, medical facility land. That is still one of the, I think the last remaining our combining zone um, properties and was zoned at 102 affordable units. Can that be made uh, with more density? to help us achieve our arena numbers. I also learned, um, I, I also have a question why your board declared the county owned property at 7th and Bromer above the harbor as excess property to sell off when our county needs to be building housing and you've said that you would be building housing on county owned properties. That's a real puzzle for me. Why would the county get rid of a property like that at a time when we need property like that for housing? I learned at the um, Housing Advisory Commission meeting when I asked the question about the par three area in Aptos, what if that owner does not want to build affordable multi-story housing and wants to build um, luxury homes? And the answer was that the county is imposing a minimum building development density and that uh, all property owners would have to build at least 75% of that number. That was news to me. I'd never heard that before. My, my question about all of this is um, the infrastructure is never addressed, and that is a big piece of it. So I hope that you will also address the infrastructure as we move our uh, work to identify these properties for dense building. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Is there anybody else in chambers? Okay, we'll close the public comment. We'll bring it back to the board and um, I recognize there'll be a motion made, which I can't make. I, what I'm really just asking for is I think um, as you go back to the planning commission, you incorporate these concerns and comments that I made so that what comes forward next includes um, I would submit, I, th I mean, to me, I think the cleanest way is just maintaining one of the parcels in its current zoning. I recognize that I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a, that may not be the, the best way to do it, but I mean, to me, that seems like the cleanest way. Uh, but I think that you've, you've heard, I'm confident that you've heard uh, the concerns and the interests that I've, I've put forward. And so to me, recognizing that there was a commitment made to the community on that, I think it would interplay very well with the development anyway. Um, and the secondary component on senior housing to the degree that at least a preference is specified, non-binding, understood, but as we move forward then, because because at the end of the day, we're gonna be doing develop, uh, excuse me, we're gonna be doing outreach to developers. And so we have the ability to have conversations with them uh, about uh, needs that the community has and one of them is senior housing. And I think that that'd be good. Um, but anyway, I'll, as please, Supervisor Arnett. Before, yeah, um, you know, to some of Zach's comments, you know, I have to say that there is, is a need for senior housing. You know, just in in our city alone, we have one council district that's entirely all senior, mostly senior housing, District Seven, and we've seen housing go over there from three hundred, four hundred prior to the pandemic to about six, seven hundred right now. And I've actually walked that district multiple times and I've seen a lot of transplants coming from North County, Santa Cruz, Mid County. Uh, the entire demographics have just shifted in that in that district. And so it, to me, it showed me that there's there's definitely a need for senior housing in Santa Cruz and actually all housing in Santa Cruz. And so to really, you know, quote a silly movie, uh, you know, I'd say that uh, we we really need housing just in mid-county, 
if we can finally begin housing in in mid county any housing in mid county santa cruz and if we can finally begin to rebuild the housing in north county i think that you know our wildest dreams would come true in south county and the dreams of home ownership in south county would become a reality so i think that we got to begin that process thank you and i and you know i think the other thing is that with the inclusionary housing ordinance and what oh, that sandy mentioned in in watsonville uh I've been there, I was there nine years and also on the planning commission two years. And with that 20% inclusion house ordinance, we've seen no problems with it. Uh, we've seen both affordable housing and market rate housing. Yes, even market rate housing with this 20% inclusionary housing ordinance. And even more recently, we've seen some workforce housing that's come to our uh, to the city as well. And there's been no issues with, with that. 20% uh, inclusion in housing ordinance in the city of Watsonville. And I think that uh, our CEO was, uh, I guess, during the tenure of that creation of that, of that inclusion in housing ordinance at the city of Watsonville too. Supervisor Koenig. Yeah, I will move that we accept and file this report on the draft six cycle housing element uh, and presentation and include uh, the direction to the planning commission to consider options uh, for specifying that the Mar Vista Drive sites, also known as PAR 3, uh, include some kind of provisions for senior housing and publicly accessible open space. And is there a second? I know there may be additional direction, but is there a second? Okay. Uh, Supervisor Cummings? I did have um, a couple additional questions. Um, I know that you all mentioned the Nexus study. I look back at the language that was in the housing element it doesn't really talk about any direction of where that nexus study is going to go in terms of exploring inclusionary, uh, the percentage of inclusionary housing. Um, and so I just wanted to understand um, because the priority of getting affordable housing is really dire at this point. And my concern is that if we move down the route of a nexus study, that it's going to punt this out another five years, but potentially or that's going to punt it out a very long period of time because what it also mentioned in the report is after the nexus study that has to be a year-long planning study that needs to take place after that and by adding all these additional all, all this time it, it seems to me that we might lose lose out on opportunities to create affordable housing in some of these new developments that we're going to see coming forward so I'd just like to get some clarification on you know when we talk about conducting a nexus study what does that time frame look like and how quickly can we have this, this take place so we did include some draft uh completion dates uh it, it's a requirement of the document that we put in uh target completion dates for each of the programs that we include in basically which chapter two of the element and i don't recall offhand which date we put for this one but i believe i want to say it was 2025 um that doesn't mean we can't complete it sooner if we have the money, if we have it funded and, you know, we have the board's direction to complete it sooner, we certainly can. But if we are late in what we promised the state, then they can come back to us and, you know, it wouldn't reflect well on the county if we're late in meeting milestones. So it's a balancing act. We don't want to overpromise promise uh, completing something earlier than we feel confident that we could deliver that um, project. As far as a year-long planning study after that, I'm not clear. I, I don't recall that being in there, but then maybe Stephanie can I, chime in. I think um, the supervisor is referring to the fact that HCD can ask you to do a subsequent study. I think our goal would be to do one study and have it address everything so we're not doing two separate studies. So that, that would be the purpose of yeah. that. And I don't recall the date either. I, I want to say it was the end of 2024, but... It's it certainly is in the document. Yep, um, I'll take a look at that again. Um, and then the other question I had um, is a little bit more conceptual, but um, based on kind of what I've heard today, it sounds like the zoning changes that have been made to accommodate the numbers that we're supposed to produce is pretty much the best that we can do, given the amount of developable space that we have. And so I'm just wondering at the when this next cycle comes up. Um, what's going to be our ability to kind of meet any future development? Because it sounds like we're kind of building out to the capacity of our infrastructure. Um, but is there 
more opportunity to to build and how is that going to relate when we get our next round of of arena numbers yeah i mean that's a really good question because i think it's only going to get more and more difficult um and i I would say we're not exactly built out, you know, I think by selecting 76 parcels for rezoning um, and also uh, using our minimum density as our methodology, um, we could be really setting ourselves up for actually meeting the, the arena. It's possible, but I think when the seven cycle comes around, the choices will get more and more difficult and also the state requirements are, are going to be that eventually if you didn't make your last arena you're still going to be held accountable for making the last arena right now we've we're kind of able to walk away from the fifth cycle and say here's our new sixth cycle but in the future I don't think that's going to be the case and so the, the choices will get more and more difficult thank you and I guess the last comment I'll make is that it, it just um to me that comment really reflects, I think, the need for board members and other elected officials to really communicate with our state electeds on, you know, as we move forward with building housing, really trying to make sure that we're building the housing that meets the needs of, of the communities. Um, I think to Supervisor Friend's point and to, you know, what we, the discussions we had around senior housing, we obviously, we need that. We need workforce housing and the ability for us to meet the needs of our community is really going to be reflected on the type of housing we can produce. And so I think we should really start having those conversations because just, you know, saying you need moderate and you need market rate and you need this, it's, it's really not helping us meet our needs. And so my hope is that we can try to work together to really bring back some local control since a lot of that's being stripped away from us. Um, and so, and then I guess the last thing I'll say as it relates to um, moving forward, um, I do want to see if some of the recommendations I've provided can be taken into consideration. Um, you know, when we talk about increasing inclusionary within this document, it's not locking us into changing our ordinance immediately. What it's moving us towards is trying to see how we can increase the amount of affordable housing and new developments so that we can meet those affordable housing needs. It's only going to help us. Um, you know, meet the goals of the arena and meet our arena numbers if we're really trying to push for more um, affordable housing. And so um, given that this is going to, there's still some opportunity for um, exploring um, increasing inclusionary percentages, I'd like to, um, well, a couple things. One would be to add item number two um, regarding replacement of affordable housing units um, demolished as a result of large new developments shall not be counted as part of any inclusionary housing requirement, but she, it should be added to them. Um, I think that that would be worth having in this next review um, as it's going to go back to the planning commission and staff can um, look into that further as well. And then along with that, um, the exploration of, inc of increasing the uh, inclusionary percentage to 20% for projects of 10 units or greater and for 50% density unit projects, um, having that inclusionary percentage increased to 25%. I'm um, having that called out, whether that's going to go into the nexus study um, or can be explored between now and when we need to adopt the cycle, the, um, the final housing element, I think would be worth um, considering. And then uh, again, um, updates to the affordable housing and lieu fees for residential developments. Um, and harmonizing the inclusionary program with state density bonus. I think the other two bullet points around um, project threshold that triggers inclusionary requirement um, was kind of included in number three and then affordability. Well, and then also I think it would be good to include affordability, affordability levels for inclusionary units. Um, Supervisor Hernandez did mention that there are differences in, in between um, what is affordable in South County versus North County. And I think that making sure that we um, are exploring um, the different levels of affordability and having that called out would be important. So uh, I'll just comment as the, the maker of the motion. Uh, I'm not willing to include any of these provisions uh, at this time. I think uh, we are on such a tight timeline with getting a, a document submitted to the state that can be approved. We've heard that the state has a, a general bias against um, some some of these programs, and so they could definitely be problematic in ultimately getting our housing element approved. And that said, I appreciate uh, your desire to create more affordable housing in our community. 
um, and to want to have a greater discussion um, and bring forward some potential solutions. Um, I just think that we should make sure that it's a discussion that's decoupled from the housing element. Um, you know, I would also just as, as my own view on this, I and mean, I think we we all agree. Uh, it's, it's incontrovertible that we have a housing crisis here and not enough affordable housing. Um, but I think that uh, maybe we disagree on the cause. Um, uh, you know, I think we have too many freaking restrictions on building housing. And, and ultimately these are more restrictions. Um, they're not, in, it's not an incentive to a housing developer to add additional requirements for what they, they can or can't do. Um, so just, you know, and, and, you know, it was pointed out by the council member from Santa Cruz, uh, that you know, you're still seeing projects move forward with a higher inclusionary percentage. The, the city also has, um, you know, much higher height allowances right now than the county in general. So that, um, is something that facilitates those, de those developments and those inclusionary percentages. Um, so, you know, I think this has to be a balanced discussion of, of give and take, you know, if we want to add a requirement for affordable housing. Um, then how can we still help to make the job of building that housing easier? Um, so again, I, I'm not supportive of including them at this time. I have to have the discussion later on separate from the housing element. I um, appreciate um, where you're coming from on this, um, Supervisor Koenig. And I would just reiterate that um, a lot of the density bonus laws, or actually the density bonus laws, are actually incentivizing more housing construction the removal of parking is making housing less expensive for developers. And also the streamline process is also making the housing, the, the time it takes to get projects uh, approved. Um, it's reducing that time, which is all going to incentivize more development. Um, I feel very strongly about this. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an amendment, a motion to amend the main motion. Um, and I'm going to include the following. Program H3, H3H be revised to include the following components, updates to the housing and lieu fees for residential developments, um, affordability levels for inclusionary units, harmonizing the inclusionary program with state density bonus law, um, the replacement of affordable housing units demolished as a result of larger new developments shall not be counted as part of any inclusionary housing requirement, but should be added to, but should be in addition to them. And that in order to encourage additional affordable housing units and to provide an incentive to density bonus projects, inclusionary housing requirements for projects of 10 units or greater shall be increased to 20%. For 50% density bonus projects, the inclusionary requirement shall be 25%. Supervisor, just to be clear, your, your amended motion includes the, the, the original motion as well. Is that right? Yes. So it's a substitute motion. Yes. Was that two and three? Yes. And part of one. Minus it's the ordinance, right? Minus four. Oh, yeah, okay. So there's a substitute motion. Is there a second? Oh, I'll second it. Okay, so the procedure is to vote on the substitute motion first. Um, I need to say that I'm, I'm going to not support it in part because it feels redundant because we're literally doing this as part of the Nexus study. Um, some of the other elements I think I could be supportive of, but not but I think just taken separately from the housing element, such as like the replacement of the affordable housing units demolished, I think it's a very good idea, but I mean, I'm not being, pre I'm being presented with a binary choice, so I have to, I have to treat it as such. Um, so we have a substitute motion. Um, if we could have a roll call on the substitute motion before we consider the original motion, please. Supervisor Koenig. No. Supervisor Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Yes. McPherson. No, it, my, my concern is timing. And yeah. friend. Yeah. No. All right. So we'll move back to the original motion, which was a motion from Supervisor Koenig and a second from Supervisor um, McPherson. Let me also say that what's good is that we're we're all in agreement about. I mean, it, there are a lot of communities in the state that aren't aren't able to meet this number. I mean, there are there are state there are communities that are being sued by HCD and such. And, and what we're actually talking about here is how do we meet the number and go beyond. And I think that that's a, a very good statement here. The disagreement that you're seeing up here is actually toward the same goal in different ways to get there. And I think that's a very healthy discussion to have. Yeah. Supervisor Cummings. Yeah, I just would like to say that um, I appreciate the comments that the other board members made and um, would like to see us move forward at a future date on some of the items that have been discussed, especially because I understand that there is a timing issue and that's been expressed by my other colleagues. And so I hope that we can explore some of these items further. Um, it sounds like outside of the housing element, but it sounds like there is a desire to explore these further. So just wanted to Thank acknowledge you. where you all are coming from and that there's a desire to continue working on this. 
Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. If we could have a roll call on the original motion. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Hernandez. Yes. McPherson. Aye. And Fred. Aye. And that passes unanimously. Looking forward to you coming back for final certification or approval from us in a couple months. Appreciate all your work on that. Um, before we move into closed session, uh, Council, is there anything that we intend to be reportable at a closed session? No. Okay, then we will move into closed session. Thank you all for attending today's meeting. You want me to unplug?